Welcome back to the A4S Summit for our second day. Today, we are focusing on climate action. I think we all know that we need to act urgently. And I am really pleased to be welcoming Hiro Mizuno, who is the former CIO of GPIF, Japan's largest pension fund, um, with $1.6 trillion of assets under management, the world's largest, um, who I know that many of you will be familiar with, but Hero now is involved in a lot of different activities. So special policy advisor to the Japanese government on green innovation and finance, also involved with a lot of different business schools, Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, to promote sustainability and business education. And last but not least, um, serves on the board of Tesla and the mission committee of Danon. So Hiro, really looking forward to your thoughts um, in terms of climate, the urgency of action, and particularly thinking of the context um, over the last year, what kind of impact the, the pandemic might have had. So over to you to share some opening reflections. Thank you, Jessica. And uh, thank you for having me once again. Uh, your Royal Highness and our ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a, uh, a bit of a shame that the, I won't be able to, uh, you know, speak to all of you in, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the special place at Claren's house, which I really enjoyed over the last several years. But uh, again, it's my honor uh, to speak to you. And uh, I stepped down from the CIO, CIO role of GPIF last March. Uh, I would like to thank again His Royal Highness and uh, A4S gave me uh, lots of inspirations and uh, you know wealth of researches. Without you, I would have achieved just a fraction of what I did during my tenure at the GPIF. So thanks again. And uh, I just uh, trying to uh, share some of my experience well at GPIF and uh, some other you know the. Uh, experiences or like involvement I had after my departure, uh, hoping that will uh, give you some of the, um, you know, the inspiration or some of the uh, uh, ideas that the, uh, the, what we can do more uh, to push this climate agenda. So um, you may be interested in my opinion on the Tesla stock, but the, uh, I try to reserve my personal opinion given my position on the board. But uh, just to tell you one thing, which is I, I just wanted to ask you, you think it's just a, a coin, you know, the accidental coincidence uh, or, you know, the kind of like a, a fate uh, in representing what's happening. Uh, just to give you one interesting story that the uh, ExxonMobil will have the largest market cap on the day of Tesla's IPO 10 years ago in the US market. And uh, now Tesla have about four times more market cap of the, uh, the ExxonMobil. And uh, last month, uh, you know, next era, uh, the world the largest wind power uh, company overtook Exxon on their market cap. So, uh, you know, it's happening. And uh, every time I talk, uh, about the, I'm asked about the Tesla stock and my view on that. Uh, I just you know don't want to comment on how expensive, how cheap, but the, at least I think it's telling us something. Like uh, you know, the Tesla's mission is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy and the transportation, probably getting more traction uh, among investors. So uh, you know, I hope to uh, share uh, my view on the where the Tesla is going, maybe in some private dinner. Uh, next year. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, uh, you know, to share with you what I think is very critical for our industry, finance and asset management to push this climate agenda. The first of all, uh, I have been encouraging all asset owners or even the in smaller institutional uh, investor to analyze the climate risk of their own portfolio and disclose it. You know, GPF started two years ago uh, disclosing uh, in compliance with the TCFD recommendation. Obviously, it wasn't perfect. 
And uh, there are a lot of pushback internally about the uh, disclosing the result of analysis because we didn't get the, uh, the comprehensive information set. And the methodology itself, we are very still you know, not very confident that methodology is actually the best methodology to do that. But we just decided to do it. And that's actually raised the internal awareness, the importance of this climate risk or climate opportunities within GPF portfolio. And by disclosing it, of course, we need to have some guts to do that because they are the particularly uh, working for the public pension fund. We are magnet for criticism and we are magnet for scrutiny. So, but we, you know, decided to do that. But by doing that, we observe a lot of changes in the attitude of other stakeholders. So we promoted the discussion from our own constituency. And also we got a lot of uh, feedback, including sales speech, obviously, from our asset managers and our service providers. So I think by analyzing your portfolio, just pick whatever the, you know, the, the framework you can feel comfortable. And I usually suggest the, the TCFD because that's the highest level framework. And uh, you basically have to evaluate the policy and the, the big picture. So, but you can go as detailed as the other, like a SASB or other methodologies, obviously, or you can buy the service from the, uh, some of like a climate risk analytical, uh, you know, the service providers, but whatever you do it and then disclose it, it will change the, uh, the way, the dynamics. So uh, the first thing I definitely would like to encourage you know, all the participants to do is do analyze your climate risk or opportunities of your own portfolio and share with the public. And uh, that will, you will see, and trust me, you will see the difference in the people's attitude and reaction to that. And the second is, um, I think the, the throughout my term at the GPIF, one of the biggest uh, and the most uh, important agenda for me is how to, uh, you know, the uh, shift our focus on just uh, the uh, rebalancing our portfolio to show more responsibility as an owner of the portfolio. So uh, we are biggest advocate of our stewardship responsibilities, and uh, we we used to have a you know the uh, the very very deep conversation with our asset managers because the GPF, uh, regardless of the size, we had a you know one hundred percent outsourcing strategy. So the we outsourced the portfolio management to the uh, the professional uh, money manager asset managers. So you know. I think they tend to underestimate the power of the stewardship or ownership. So even the passive managers who cannot trade to reflect their views on the climate risk, but they can still be still step up more as a steward and exercise their engagement power and also the, uh, the voting power uh, to promote the change. So at the end of the day, you know, there's a two way for the other uh, investor to make a difference. One is the other uh, change in allocation or changing that por uh, the portfolio composition and, you know, active ownership. So uh, I've been the biggest, you know, the other uh, uh, advocate of the importance of the uh, stewardship of active ownership because, you know, um, divestment may make a difference and send a strong signal. But so far, you know, the uh, it actually, you know, ended up making some oil companies share more attractive to the people who don't care about the climate risk because now it's very high dividend, you know, the paying stock. So uh, sometimes, you know, the, uh, the divesting and the, the trading the, uh, the particular uh, asset will send a signal. And uh, at the end of the day, as I talked, the, as an, uh, you know, took the example of Tesla versus like, uh, you know, Exxon, we'll see the difference. But I think it's much more important for a long-term investor, you know, particularly like a pension fund or like a retail investor, to remain as an owner and uh, demand the change and it's promote the change. Because at the end of the day, you know, the investor is not, you know, the has a, is not almighty. I mean, uh, all we can do is basically by trading and affecting the price or engage and have a conversation uh, with the portfolio companies. 
uh, to accelerate the uh, you know the change uh, to serve all of us. So stewardship and engagement is uh, of uh, increasing importance, and uh, I encourage all the other investors, whether you are institutional or retail, just raise the voice, ask a question to your Arsenal managers how they do it. And uh, if you are more influential, the uh, clients of the asset management companies, you should keep an eye on how they exercise voting uh, in this agenda, and uh, you will see a lot of discrepancies. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, the one area I focused on, and I still, you know, the want to invite more investors to join the bandwagon to promote just like a shareholders activism on the climate uh, in agenda. And as you probably know that the Climate Action 100 Plus, which the uh, GPF is a part of, uh, made a lot of like, a, you know, su successful uh, discussion uh, with portfolio companies. Just to, you know, remind you, you know, the companies who produce high carbon, you know, the footprint is not a bad company. They served our society for in the past uh, in the way we want it. But now that our, you know, the, uh, the our, uh, demanding much more cleaner energy, much more cleaner industrial activities. So it's us who changed, and now it's the time for them to change to reflect the other uh, uh, needs of the uh, society and ourselves. So, um, <clears throat> and uh, in that aspect, uh, I still see the uh, a lot of like, uh, you know, the you know discrepancy as I say that the, uh, in the way that the asset manager, uh, you know, react to that the new uh, demand by their customers. So they will keep an eye on that. Um, the other, the next things I encourage the people to consider uh, in the field of green financing is, I said this last year, but the I think the innovation of our industry has been appalling. You know, the uh, we keep demanding, we keep investing in innovation by corporations, but if we look at how innovative uh, financial product we have been investing in, we have very little innovation. But recently, the green bond is actually getting attraction. So uh, now the, uh, the even the big sovereign like uh, Germany or like uh, France and the EU is now you know the uh, raising a green bond, and I've been pushing Japanese government to do the same. But the uh, the green bond is one uh, you know early sort of adaptation of the financial you know innovation. But these days we see the sustainable bond the other stuff. But I really encourage the people to invest and try those new product or financial product to promote the change and accelerate the change because you know we need it uh and uh, as i said i've been very disappointed like uh, you know the we keep asking the company to be to innovate to to, to uh to uh, to change the 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 way they operate but we need to be more innovative so try those i uh, like a new uh sustainability product you can just uh, pick the uh, ESG indices with the other uh, GPF, spend like a three, four years, you know, gradually shifting the money from the, uh, the market cap, very traditional, uh, you know, the uh, uh, index to the ESG indices to promote that. But we need more innovation in our financial uh, or investment product uh, to promote the, uh, the faster uh, reallocation of capital and uh, create the, uh, the proper incentive uh, for the issuer, because at the moment, I mean, even a green bond is not uh, doing a good job promoting uh, incentive uh, for the, uh, the issuer to issue green bond. But we started seeing some of the big issue uh, issuance uh, seems to create the uh, the green premium, and um, some of the fiduciary investor may have a trouble with the, uh, the accepting a lower interest rate when it's green, but market is accepting it. And uh, my view is, at the end of the day, I haven't seen people who said we only invest in, we have seen many now, increasingly more number of the investors says we only invest in a green product, but I haven't seen many who say opposite. So uh, the uh, supply demand balance is favorable to promote those kind of like a green and sustainability product. And I definitely would like all the investors to consider uh, how to, use that kind of the new uh, investment project. And the uh, next things I just wanted to 
share with you is the um, importance of the uh, uh, challenging the uh, the uh, stand, uh, you know the uh, disclosure standard. So the people very often tells me like uh, you know they wanted to use the ESG information for their portfolio management, but the information is not available or in information is not standardized. Well, I think, you know, it's a valid statement that at the moment we probably have like a 200 different, you know, the initiative trying to create the standard, uh, you know, disclosure uh, or risk measurement, uh, you know, the mechanism. But at the end of the day, you know, we make an investment taking those like, uh, you know, the St not standardized information to make money. That's a part of our, our job. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I hate to just uh, use the Tesla as an example, but I know people probably be able to uh, connect that much more easily when I use it. You know, it's very difficult to explain uh, Tesla's stock price or valuation using the, the classic matrix, but people, do that because the other uh, it's investors like uh, you know the job and investors like uh, you know the uh, functionality to price in those things which is not numerical which is not standardized so i think like uh, you know i don't understand why the people you know regard the climate risk as one special things we they cannot change their investment strategy until we manage to standardize the uh, the you know the information uh, or disclosure uh you know the uh, disclosure uh standard so we just wanted to uh make sure uh definitely we would promote and uh, definitely better to march all those efforts because we need to have those like uh, ngos and a standard uh building uh the uh, organization to work together because we share the common goal but it shouldn't be the uh, hindrance or it shouldn't, uh, you know, the uh, block you from using those information. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, you don't need to wait until the, those things happen. So uh, stop complaining about the lack of the, uh, the standardization. It will come. Uh, and even if it doesn't come uh, in the short, uh, in the near future, there are a lot of information available and uh, picking whatever you think works for you is also the, the part of your responsibility as a professional asset manager. So last but not least, I just wanted to share some of my uh, dialogue with the uh, uh, asset managers uh, inside of the GPF as well as the, uh, the external money managers and uh, you know the, uh, the portfolio companies. I just had a lot of opportunity to discuss them with the, uh, you know, uh, about their view on the Paris Agreement. And uh, I usually start with asking them, do you believe the uh, you know climate risk is climate change and the climate risk is real? Ninety nine percent of the asset managers says yes, and then we ask. I I, I followed up with the question asking, uh, do you think we need to achieve or we need to meet the Paris Agreement? And uh, seventy percent of them say yes, and then I continues with another question asking. Do you think we can meet it? We can, we can, you know, we can make the uh, the Paris Agreement uh, happen, or like a net zero 2050 uh, happens, and uh, can we? And uh, still, 70 percent or 60 percent of people say yes. And then the last question I ask is, do you think we would do that? And then the the other, you probably have a 50 50 split, in the best case scenario. <laughs> You know, many cases I hear that the other uh, people say, yes, we can, but we wouldn't. So uh, that's, the, that's the reality we are facing. And uh, investor is not really changing their allocation because they really cannot uh, use the, uh, the 2050 net zero or the Paris Agreement scenario as their base case scenario. Because in the investment or asset management or evaluation of the, uh, the portfolio, how to set the uh, base case, what did they use for base case scenario is very critical. And at the moment, I really don't see that the, uh, the many investors uh, use that as a base case scenario because they are very skeptical. So again, you know, the, when we see that kind of skepticism blocking us, we need to ask where it's coming from. So I 
continued asking them the questions. So what what makes you believe that it's not going to happen, <laughs> or what makes you skeptical about the are achieving that goal? And uh, my conclusion was they are more skeptical about political will than the uh, you know the innovation uh, we can uh make to meet that goal so i have been very actively involved involved in a discussion with the japanese government on that the uh, green policy because you know that's what i thought is a one good way to reduce that uncertainty or reduce that you know increase the predictability uh of the uh, base case scenario and as you saw that the uh you know several weeks ago we i finally managed to uh, have the our prime minister commit to 2050 net zero, and uh, so now major economies UK, EU, China still have like a 2060. But you know, the, given their situation, probably it's a very you know ambitious and uh, pretty reasonable goal. And uh, Japan committed to 2050 net zero, and I hope US will be joining the bandwagon. So I think that we are reducing uncertainty, uh, but. I think that if you are, uh, you know, in the country where the the, the government hasn't committed to that, I really uh, encourage you to get involved in the post proactive discussion with your own government and uh, to to reduce the uh, uncertainty in that uh, scenario. Because for investors, I learned throughout my career as a professional investor and a financier, you know, reducing uncertainty is the uh, the most important and a critical uh aspects of the uh, the financial management so uh i think we need to reduce uncertainty in a political will uh as it seems to be blocking a lot of investors from uh you know the um, from drastically changing their uh approach to their portfolio investment so thanks again thank you uh your royal highness and uh, air force team uh as i said you have been uh, you know the uh a uh, strong inspiration for, for my work, and uh, I continue to promote the ESG in our industry and I hope to continue to work with you. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Hiro. Um, I'd love to ask, if that, that, that you've covered a lot of ground there, so I, I'd quite like to follow up, maybe start with that last point that you were making, because I think it's a really, a really good one, and you are seeing more and more governments committing to net zero. And I've seen that firsthand as well, whether it's um, thinking of, of businesses in a UK context or in other countries we work where you see that commitment from government, it really does galvanize both business mm -hmm. and, and the investment community. Um, we've got COP26 now, it, it's, it's, it would have been, it would have happened by now. Um, it's now happening next year. So we've got a year to go until then. What more do you think business and the finance community can do to make that a successful? You know, well, I think the, uh, uh, it's probably uh, ended up uh, better and the more constructive uh cop uh as now we may see the drastic change in the u.s policy so uh on climate so uh it probably you know we may be may, may be lucky that uh you know that now we have uh, some time uh for all uh you know the our government to uh first of all uh reacting to this pandemic but at the same time it gave uh, government. I, I see that very clearly uh, in my uh, conversation with the Japanese government. So uh, this pandemic made them uh, think once again, we are putting a lot of money into the system uh, and we need to recover. But uh, as I said, oh, you know, they said to the other uh, Prime Minister Suga when I met him, we are borrowing heavily from future generations because now for us to just get through this pandemic, you know, the uh, we are borrowing, you know, the uh, you know dozens of, you know, the uh, the several. Well, it's not several, but it's the like a thirty trillion dollars, uh, you know, the, uh, the from the market. 
and the borrowing from the market meaning borrowing from the people and uh, I think that given this the uh, level of the uh, the national debt we actually borrowing from future generations so uh, for us to think about how to use this money uh, to deliver a better future for the future generation is very critical and uh, that kind of mindset probably didn't happen uh, if we didn't have this pandemic so uh, it's just a uh, the pandemic has said terrible things, but the, uh, the it um, actually the uh, uh, was a wake up call to the a lot of like a global leaders that the uh, that we just need to care about how we rebuild our, our society and our, our economy. So uh, that's uh, the one thing I just wanted to uh, say. And what the uh, that we can do more to make this like uh, you know the COP twenty six successful is, well, I say like uh, you know the. It's been only several weeks since the uh, the Suga announced the you know, 2050 net zero, but the uh, you know, let's say Nikkei newspaper, like uh, that's a Financial Times equivalent of a Japanese you know a Japanese newspaper. Every single day, at least a ten article related to climate change and uh, you know the innovation uh, in the clean or green. Uh, you know the green technology. So I think that's changed the uh, the mindset of the older participants. You know the finance and also investor finance and the uh, corporates. So I think we are setting a stage, uh, COP26. And uh, the one thing which I'm showing here is the SDGs and the, all the spirits of these kind of things and FOS is you know uh, although I advocated that the uh, the people should. Uh, kind of like uh, be more actively lobbying uh, with their uh, own government to promote this agenda because it's result in the reduced risk on their investment. But I think the uh, the part active participation from the private sector is a key, and that's another thing the, uh, that we are getting uh, you know the the more and more evidence. You know, I recently have a uh, you know the. Uh, uh, discussion with Mark Benioff. He's the founder of the Salesforce.com. And uh, you know, he he keeps telling, uh, keeps saying like a business is the best platform uh to accelerate your change, which I agree because government can set the rule and uh, the having uh, the uh, the uh, predictability of the uh, political uh, of policy related to climate is very critical because the, uh, that's basically increasing a risk of our investment. But on the other hand, uh, the business can be uh, the biggest contributor to uh, to achieve Paris Agreement goal, and investors obviously uh, can accelerate that. So I think it's the uh, the the focus is not only on the government and. Uh, I'm really getting encouraged. A lot of like a business leaders says we just cannot wait until the government set the policy, because the other uh, we have our customers demanding us to change. We have our investors asking us to change. So the other uh, corporates now self motivating, self incentivizing themselves. So uh, I think the other uh, so just answer your question in a wrong way, but the I think the. Uh, People's mindset and, and uh, also the environment that everybody's operating is now changing, and uh, change is happening faster than ever. And uh, so we definitely see uh, a lot of positive contribution from the private sectors and uh, at the, for the COP success. Yeah, and have you um, changed your perspective? You know, you've you've changed your role. You're now. Um, probably freer than you might have been when you were working at GPIF too, although you were you were fairly activist there in terms of really pushing for change. Um, but now you you know you sit on on board, so you're you've flipped to the corporate side, you sit on a number of different committees. Um, how has that changed your perception, either in terms of some of the challenges that might be faced in getting that change or um, you know, different levers, different different areas where you can advocate yourself? Yeah, sure. I mean, um, I, I, I actually the, the, uh, accepted to, uh, to work with the other uh, several organizations, uh, as you just, uh, you know, the list is some of them. Uh, but, you know, I'm lucky to receive too many offers <laughs> to, to accept. So uh, 
I had a luxury of picking the one which I think they are the most effective to promote my my agenda, which is ESG and sustainability. So uh, the I try to lever that as a biggest asset owner when I was reading the GPIF. But when I was I was there, there are several area I felt that the uh, the need to uh, step up uh, to become um, you know the more contributor. Uh, to push this sustainability agenda. One is uh, business education. You know, they, uh, it's natural to assume younger generations are more, you know, they are naturally, uh, you know, the uh, concern about climate change because that's their future. And uh, they probably have much less uh, vested interest in the, you know, the, uh, the current uh, business model or current situation. So it's natural to assume younger generation is gonna be is, is the biggest promoter of like a SDGs of this agenda. But every time I discuss with the other uh, uh, MBA faculties when I was at the GP, because I was invited to speak and I spoke with the other finance faculty and the students, I continue to be surprised uh, that the uh, the first younger students seems to be less kind of like. A, excited about this agenda or this topic and uh, particularly finance they actually train the young business professional in the opposite way right so um how about a business school uh, wrote a case case study on a gpf esg you know the uh activities two years ago now they teach that to uh, every single first year student. So uh, I went to, t you know, the uh, joint 10 classes uh, at the beginning of this year. So a GPF case now used as a case to study and uh, discuss ESG, but it's only so far used at the several business schools. And uh, I actually did my research. Very few business school has the other uh, courses on the sustainability and which has been disappointing to me was there's no ESG uh, in finance curriculum. Mm -hmm. Although ESG started as an investment strategy, but finance faculty seems to refuse that the investment, uh, you know, the uh, investment theory. So uh, even at the Harvard, GPF case was taught as the uh, part of the corporate responsibility and the leadership. So uh, that's why I you know, discuss this, my idea of the, uh, putting that in the finance education uh, at the, uh, the business schools and, uh, you know, the Harvard, Oxford, Cal uh, the Cambridge, and now Kellogg agreed to do that. So uh, that's why I've been spending time with them. And uh, the other, uh, the group of uh, people or educational body, I was very uh, keen to uh, be more uh, involved after my graduation from GPF was a CFA Institute. Because CFA is the professional, uh, you know, the um, uh, education body, uh, you know, to give the uh, CFA uh, to young finance professional. But if you look at the CFA curriculum, there are very little or pretty much none uh, on ESG, although that's became the hottest topic in their employees or in the finance industry. So uh, that's another area that the professional education, I, I wanted to uh, change a little bit. So uh, I'm very glad to have like a Margaret, uh, the, uh, you know, the new CEO of the, uh, the CFA Institute. She is really uh, share the same view on this. And uh, so I was invited to serve on the future of finance uh, Future Finance Advisory Council of CFA Institute, and have a uh, you know the I'm honored to have an opportunity to work with her and the CFA Institute to promote the education on this. So professional education and the business education is one area I'm trying to uh, affect. And the other is I said like you know the I just wanted to see how corporate executive can push this agenda and how they can weather short term pressure from investors. So I just always had a view that the, the corporate governance is important, but unfortunately, the people who are interested in the corporate governance topic is more interested in how to use the corporate governance to push the CEO work harder to deliver higher dividends and uh, that kind of things. So, but you know, I can see that now very clearly serving on the Tesla's board as well as the Danone's mission committee. 
you know, I think the board has a role to play or governance has a role to play to make sure CEO can not only being, you know, the, uh, the urge to promote the short-term profitability, but the CEO will address long-term agenda like uh, the climate. And the board should be able to, in a way, protect those you know, executives to pursue this kind of agenda when they are under short-term pressure from the, the investors. So the, I think the corporate governance or the corporate board used to be regarded as a, just a representative of a shareholders and uh, make sure the CEO works for them. But now I think the modern corporate governance should let the CEO not only focus on the short-term profitability, but also how they, you know, the um, uh, approach the other stakeholders, including our own, you know, planet. So Danon went extreme uh, by totally changing their uh, the article in corporation from C corporation to uh, yeah. enterprise mission. That's the uh, legally uh, and uh, contractually uh, designed to serve multi-stakeholders. So I'm also honored to be invited by Emmanuel Faber, you know, CEO, to uh, to serve on their first, you know, the mission committee to keep an eye on how the uh, the CEO and uh, the corporate executive uh, promote agenda other than shareholders' uh, value creation. So uh, we we keep discussing with them uh, how Danone will be able to contribute to the net zero society. And uh, you know less, uh, you know le le less plastic and etc. So it's been very interesting. I've been actually trying to live a different way. And also, I as I said, I was very active uh, in engaging with the, the government, not only Japanese government, other government, even when I was the GPIF. But now I do it officially. So uh, you know, the, I'm official policy advisor of the Japanese government on green innovation and finance. So, uh, so those are areas that I always felt it's necessary to change, but I wasn't able to do as much as I, you know, I wished when I was at the GPIF. That's, that's what I'm trying to, you know, the, uh, uh, to work uh, on right now. Yeah, uh, it's great to hear it's something that um, whether it's around the education or some of the the, the aspects you're touching on there in, in terms of board and corporate governance that we've been working on for a long time. So I I can de definitely appreciate the, the, the challenges that you've been having. But also, I do think that there is, as you've highlighted there, starting to be a shift in really thinking about how do you embed these issues into the heart of education? Um, for for finance professionals, um, I think we've got time for maybe one, max two more questions. So one I'd like to come back to is particularly in the current context, but whether it is at the government level for investors, for businesses, um, there are a whole multitude of challenges faced, and the pandemic has made those even even tougher. To deal mm -hmm. with. Um, you're wearing an SDG um, pin. I think that that sums up some of the different diverse goals mm -hmm. that we need to be reaching forward. Climate um, cuts across a lot of those goals, so could either mm -hmm. undermine them completely or help to drive success and our achievement of them. So mm -hmm. can you say a little bit more about how you see things like a green recovery? How could that support some of the social dimensions as well, how you, from your experience, you think that that integrated decision-making can happen amongst those different actors? Sure. I think the, um, you know, the, among E, S, and G, uh, as I said, the, uh, the G has been a little bit mis understood in my opinion uh so as i said like it's not all about the how to increase a dividend but they just to make sure uh the ceo takes care of the things which goes beyond their own tenure uh because climate probably not gonna you know the uh, affect the company's the balance sheet or like a bottom line uh within two or three years time but we definitely need them to focus on that as well and a social as well you know, the increasing like, uh, you know, gender diversity on the board, probably not going to improve their profitability next quarter, but the, uh, it's important for the sustainability or sustainable growth of their business. 
and uh, make those business decisions more resilient to the all the different circumstances. So E and S has the uh, the nature of that that's actually affect the company quite likely beyond uh, incumbent CEO's tenure. Uh, so that's why the government governance is so important to make sure that the uh, you know the CEO is incentivized to deal with that and also the uh, CEO is actually protected by the others. And uh, so G is that and the E is obvious and uh, E is much easier for us to uh, you know agree what are the issues. But when it comes to S, it's much more uh, confusing in a way. Uh, so to be very honest with you, until recently, until this pandemic, I think although investor always says, oh, we think the ESGs are important, but the people had much less weight on S. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the way we are the GPF, I mean, we invest in uh, several ESG indices. And we tracked actually the uh, the convergence of the uh, rating by different ESG analysts uh, on you know the same companies and also the by ESNG. So, uh, but we observed obvious convergence of the E scores because now E area, like particularly climate, we have a lot of information. Although people complain it's not standardized or it's not the uh, the comprehensive, but we we have a lot of information so that we have information uh you know the conclusion will get closer and closer but when it comes to s we found it the very little almost no convergence in the rating by the different analysts because people still don't know how to look at that so uh s is the area remained very open and uh but what i like about this pandemic i mean uh, the if the only one I like about the pandemic is that it just made people realize that the S is actually very important, probably as important as the, uh, the E uh, for society and for us and actually for the capital market to remain sustainable, right? So uh, I think the uh, now, you know, that the, uh, the if you ask the people, do you think the ESG is important? And uh, until this pandemic, you, if you actually push them harder, oh, you say ESGs are important, but which you are particularly interested in, they only pick one uh, or two. But now we see more, sort of like, a, you know, the um, uh, portfolio of different interests and uh, different concerns. So uh, this pandemic made S is a serious and the hottest area of the ESG investing. And... Uh, and also, the, I started hearing much more people uh, discuss S issue in relation to climate. Mm -hmm. Because the climate uh, is it's the same, like, like pan pandemic and climate in a way similar, because they tend to affect the socially disadvantaged advantaged people uh, much more than the, uh, the sort of like, a, you know, established or more privileged people. So... Uh, I think the other uh, we are we are going to hear more and more uh, the people discuss climate and the social issue in in a sort of like a combination, and uh, I think that's 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 what I wanted, uh, you know, for the last several years, and I'm really uh, encouraged to see, you know, I hear the same from the many investors and many financiers. Yeah, fantastic, and here are, um, a final question for you is if you look at the trends around climate and and we're going to come on to that in a little bit more detail later um, in this session looking at some of the science and and the responses to it but what what makes you hopeful that we will overcome the massive challenge that we face in really addressing climate well i think the, uh, the i'm getting a more and more uh, optimistic uh because you know Five years ago, actually six years ago, when I started the uh, at the GPIF, and uh, just uh, you know three months later, I raised the uh, the discussion about the uh, the joining a PRI, and uh, I got a huge pushback. It's more about the uh, sort of not even a skepticism; it's more like a denial. Uh, and over the five years, you know, we started. You know, we hear very very. Uh, 
I mean, we, we don't hear very much like, uh, you know, the, that kind of like, uh, you know, the, uh, the denial. We still hear that, but it's much less. And the skepticism is still there. But as I said, like, if we make sure the political will is there, uh, you know, skepticism will, uh, will fade out. And, uh, you know, like electric vehicle, everything, I mean, uh, which is disruptive, uh, swipe the market with the S-carp. So I think the, the all these like, climate-related investment uh, activities or like ESG and those kind of things now are the, on a steep curve uh, to catch up. So uh, at the beginning, it's very, very slow. But over the last 12 months, you know, every month I see the uh, more positive developments. And I believe in the humanity and we are very creative. And as I said, as I repeat, when I asked the other investors even a year ago, what made you not to believe in us achieving Paris Agreement? They are, they are not skeptical about the innovation we can bring in. They are more concerned about the uh, more skeptical about political will, and which I think we are getting now. So uh, I, I think the, uh, you know, I'm not fully convinced we can still, we, we can achieve it because they, we just need to, you know, put together more forces to make it happen. And also, I really personally don't think that Paris Agreement are good, is not good enough. We probably need to achieve it much quicker, right? So, uh, but look, you know, the every innovation, every change in, uh, you know, the, uh, in, in a trend starts slow, but it just uh, picks up very quickly, uh, showing S curve. And uh, the way I see it, even just uh, tracking how many ESG and sustainability related articles appearing on the uh, Nikkei, FT, Finan you know, the, uh, the Wall Street Journal, you see the uh, S curve. Uh, so that gives me a lot of hope. And uh, I think the, uh, you know, uh, everybody has a way to lever this agenda. And uh, if you look at the SDGs, it has uh, 17 goals, but it's actually only have 16 goals because 17 was achieved that with the partnership. So uh, it's not a goal, but partnership is important. So uh, everybody who's participating, and I appreciate you listening to my keynote and my, my interview with Jessica, but the, uh, the, I, I try, you know, I, I hope I give some ideas how you can deliver from your, where you are sitting on and uh, you know that everybody works hard and uh, works together, we'll achieve it. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Hero. Really interesting insights and I agree. I think that there's lots there for everyone to take away and act on. And as you've highlighted there, we need to, but that is becoming a real groundswell. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks a lot.